Good evening. Good evening. Oh, good. Welcome to this evening's presentation and our ongoing series, Dialogues of Discovery. Uh, this evening, we're very lucky to have with us Manu Prakash, who um, grew up, was born and raised in India, came to this country to do graduate work at MIT, where he obtained a PhD in applied physics. He's now on the faculty at Stanford in the bioengineering department. Much more information about his life is in this little uh, pamphlet you have. He's won many awards, including last year, one of the MacArthur Genius Awards. So Manu has a very varied research uh, program at Stanford, but the aspect we're going to hear about today is his interest and ability to make simple, useful tools for the community, the worldwide community, to improve health and welfare. And I think that's what he's going to concentrate on today. And I think he's going to do more than talk from looking at this table. So I'm not going to take any more of his time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, can everybody hear me? Um, yes. I'm hearing myself as well as an echo. Is that good? Can you hear me now? Nope. Okay, I'll just shout. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. I've heard about this place uh, from wonderful friends, uh, from people, uh, but it is remarkable to actually step on this campus and you know see the famous pond. And, uh, uh, and one of the things that I'll try to do today is uh, uh, try to share a little bit with a, a little more of a philosophical approach uh, that I take towards science and why it's so important for all of us to share the tools of science with a broader community. Um, and one of the contexts that I often phrase when I try to tell and talk about this is frugal science. And uh, I was flying uh, on the airport to get here. I had some tools with me. These are the ones that made it through TSA. Uh, <laughs> there are a couple ones that didn't make it through. It was a complex thing, so I just decided not to explain. There are many times I have to do demos right while I'm going through x-rays. Uh, but that is the point. That is the point that when you start sharing science uh, with a broader group of people, they get curious. Uh, so that's the philosophy that I'll try to share today. Um, and uh, the work that I'll talk about is uh, done uh, by myself and my uh, lab members and my students and postdocs. Uh, it's an incredible honor most of the time to work with young people as well uh, and engage them. Uh, and of course, we have a wonderful group of uh, people who actually support, even though the science is frugal, sometimes it takes many, many years to develop some of these ideas that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, and as Jerry pointed out, uh, today specifically, I chose to talk about a very specific part of my lab, uh, which is uh, demonstrated on the right. Uh, it's the frugal science and global health. I have a split brain, so there is the other part of marine biophysics. If some of you are there tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. So unfortunately, you won't get to see gorgeous marine animals doing the things that they do. But remember, uh, the point of this talk is much more about not hearing from my science, but how you and the community and anybody else who cares can actually engage in the process of discovery. Uh, those are my two little kids. Uh, that allowed me to actually come here, so my wife uh, was taking care of them. Uh, and one of the things that I'll try to also bring up is this idea that sometimes uh, some of the most remarkable things are right in front of us. And why is it that it takes so long sometimes to uncover them? Uh, and this is really, uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go to new landscapes. Uh, but I am saying that sometimes it's very important to have new eyes. And those new eyes sometimes come from scientists. Sometimes it can also come from the community and the society at large. Uh, in the context of today, when you start thinking about uh, an idea, you pull out your phone and you Google it. You, know, you can find all kinds of information. I could tell you about phenomenal organisms, and you will suddenly Google it and you know, might be looking at its genome, and uh, you could blast search it on your phone. There is an incredible amount of information in science that's out there. 
One of the challenges that we face today, that the experience of science, why we do science and sit down and, and hunker on a bench, that is very expensive. Not everybody around the world is fortunate to be in a campus like Genalia or on a campus like Stanford, and that's a problem. Uh, and frankly, when you start thinking about very broadly about science education and healthcare, there is a phenomenal group of people who really miss out. There are no tools for creativity for them to really express themselves. So this context of bridging the gap between information and experience, information is running really fast. I really care about bringing experience of science into the mix, and I use the word frugal science for something like that. Uh, we're going to start with an experiment <laughs> to share with you a little bit of the experience of science. This is also a little of a quiz or a, a wake-up call. Uh, and I am going to, so let's switch to the uh, camera for a second. And it's a little bit unfortunate uh, that I'm going to show something here. Uh, I have a bottle of uh, food color. Uh, this is something that you can all buy uh, from a kitchen or a grocery store. Uh, and I have some glass slides right here, any standard glass slide. And what I'm going to do is take a drop of uh, this food coloring, and I put it right there. And you can watch it uh, for hours. Uh, <laughs> not much is happening. Uh, but. Uh, and this is the remarkable aspect of, about experience of science is uh, I'm going to now put another drop right next to it. And it's the same chemical. Uh, they're just water. And now if we were to watch this uh, for a little bit of time, uh, and one of the unfortunate bits of that TSA story is uh, uh, the experiment works best uh, when you clean the glass slides. Uh, and these glass slides are not so clean, so it's happen something is happening there, uh, but a little bit more slowly. So we're going to come back to this. Uh, uh, but I'm going to show you a quick video of the same thing, just sped up a little bit. Of course, we could spend the entire hour watching this as well. <laughs> and that's how we do the experiments, quite literally. Uh, but an important aspect of video I'm about to show you, I'm not going to tell you anything about how it works. And that's the important aspect of for you to not look up what you're about to see, but actually do this experiment, especially if you have a young one at home, to do it with them as well. So let's just watch this video. It's that same glass slide. I made a little Sharpie. Uh, now I added different colors to it. And suddenly something remarkable is happening. These movies are sped up around uh, one to four times. The same color, they're talking to each other uh, on a normal glass slide. And if you were to do a rainbow of colors, you can already imagine what's about to happen. Uh, you see this orchestra. And that's what I mean by experience of science. Uh, all of you have watched food coloring or just water, and I'm assuming uh, some of you might not have experienced this phenomena that most of the, this is just water and a little bit of food coloring, but they have a capacity to talk to each other, they chase, they run around, uh, they have a sense of self, which will become clear <laughs> in a moment. Uh, and that's what I mean by experience of science, that when you see something like this, there is no way you can look away. But, you know, you can read about this work, and it took us four years to figure out the mechanisms of how this whole phenomena happens. And there are phenomenal connections that we think about once we understood this, uh, of how some of the simplest systems can also show and demonstrate biological-like capacities like chemotaxis. So the example that you saw with food coloring and water is the simplest example of chemotaxis, where these two entities can pass information from each other and use that information to sense and then become motile. And of course, this is a phenomenal area of research, and biology is far more complex. But just an observation that could have happened in anybody's kitchen table actually allows us to have a fresh look at the same problem. Uh, and again, since I wanted to use that as an example of information and experience, I would advise you to not read the paper. Please don't read the paper. You will ruin it for yourself. 
You don't have to spend four years on it, but spend some time. Think about where the energy comes from. You know, we haven't invented a perpetual motion machine. Those things are going round and round. Why and how? Uh, and when you start doing that, you will better appreciate what I'm trying to explain with the notion of experience of science. Uh, the challenge that we started with, again, I'll reiterate this, is the fact that majority of the world calls this picture a school. This is a picture that I took in Ghana. And you can see, I mean, on one hand, you could say there is a roof, but there is nothing on the walls that would inspire anybody to do something. Uh, that's a picture of a hospital. That's another picture that we took in Ghana of a van that arrives at a bus stop, uh, and once a while, there is a doctor in it. And around a billion people in this planet essentially live with an infrastructure that looks like this, which would be no roads, no electricity, no running water, and hence no access to science education or education for that matter, or any healthcare services. Roughly around a billion people are qualified that fall below the poverty line. Out of the two billion kids, one billion of them live below the poverty line. So how are we supposed to inspire kids around the world uh, with, uh, you know, of course, inspire them to also solve the problems that we are creating at the first hand? Uh, and this is really the start for at least me and many others to start thinking about the context of bringing science outside the lab. Uh, here is another picture. Uh, I do a lot of field work. We take these tools to remote places to both test them, to share them, to understand new problems. This is a picture from Madagascar that I took last year. This road that uh, I was walking on takes me 12 hours walking on this road, takes me to a village. That's the village we actually work in. On average, most villagers and most people in Madagascar would live six to seven hours walking distance. This also happens to be a malaria endemic area, so you have a child that's sick, and you're going to be walking 12 hours with them to come to any place where anybody could even do the first diagnosis. Um, and this is the only sort of a sad picture, but I have to share this with you uh, sometimes to understand that infectious diseases till today take an incredible toll on human lives. This is a picture that I took accidentally in uh, Uganda where I was with my interpreter talking and playing with these kids. I was just walking by and I casually pulled out my phone and took this picture, but some of you already recognize these kids are sitting on the graveyards of their brothers and sisters. There's a pregnant mother at the back. This is a place that has highest amount of malaria in Uganda itself. And you start asking yourself this question that, you know, we have faced this problem for a very long while. How do we move forward from thinking about pictures like this to actually making a change? And I'm not saying I have the answers or anybody has the answers, but it is extremely important to be out in the field to be reminded of this, because sometimes we forget that infectious diseases are a solved problem, which is not the case. Uh, on the bright side, this is Alex I met again in Uganda. He has four years of uh, microbiology training. He knows more microbiology. He can grow all kinds of organisms that I can. And he was placed in this field site. Uh, and I asked him, where is your lab? You know, you are supposed to be a microbiologist. And he points out that those beds that you see are his lab. When there is no patient on it, he will use that bed as a lab. And of course, uh, there's not much there uh, to use as a lab. And he would much rather drive a taxi and make an earning for his family rather than fight diseases out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> So one of the contexts for us to really is to think about tools that people like Alex can use out in the field. The credit and the capabilities really belong to community health workers who spend time in the communities, but we need to think about how to empower them to do better. Uh, we've spent a significant amount of time in the field trying to take technologies like molecular diagnostics, microscopy, centrifugation. And one lesson that I learned out in the field was from a gentleman right in the middle there uh, who mentioned to me uh, that uh, sometimes uh, when we showed them the microscopes that I'll talk a little bit about, he said, uh, come back and bring technologies to me where you can do diagnosis under a tree. So I take that to heart. And many things that we work on are essentially designed to not use electricity, not use any infrastructure, and be able to operate almost in very rugged and harsh environment. Uh, so I'm going to do a, a quick demo now to tell you uh, where ideas and technologies come from. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm sure you can all just see me. So this is an easy one. Uh, here's a piece of scotch tape. Everybody has played with scotch tape before right? 
Uh, I'm going to come a little bit closer and I'm going to ask your name. Uh, Rowena. Rowena. I'm going to uh, be close to Rowena and you're supposed to listen to the sound that this scotch tape is going to produce. Uh, so listen to that annoying screeching sound, okay? Yeah. You all heard that? Uh, unfortunately, I just exposed Rowena to some x-rays. Uh, it's very little amount of x-rays, and clearly uh, this is something that if you take flights, we're exposed to x-rays, and you've been playing with scotch tape all your life. But it turns out, when you peel scotch tape, it produces x-rays. So I'll do that again. And if this was a perfectly dark room, you would have seen light being emitted at the point of this peeling. So I'll do that again. Right where this happens, and to just really convince you, uh, here is actual data from a, a group at UCLA spinning scotch tape. And the moment the motor starts turning, you're going to hear the counts. And right there, they're emitting x-rays. This was a paper written in 1950s. That's the emission of light by a Russian group. And it was written in Russian, so it got buried in the literature. Not many people believed it. And Putterman's lab at UCLA reconsidered that idea. Of course, uh, we still don't understand completely the phenomena of tribal luminescence that causes it, but they were able to use a tool like this to actually build an x-ray machine that you could do somebody's x-ray on. I find that remarkable for many reasons, and this is why I coin and use the term frugal science, because sometimes, as I said again, incredible phenomena are hidden in an absolute mundane object. And now uh, there is a company trying to essentially build uh, electricity free or high voltage uh, uh, free x-ray systems that could be used in the field, uh, but primarily powered by this mechanism. So one of the things that I want you to remember from this talk is, you know, watch what's under your nose. Uh, and what's remarkable about this as scientists is there's just an absolute joy when you uncover one of those nature's pieces. And it takes a lot of time to understand, but it's very important to keep our eyes open. Uh, I'll give a few examples, and I'm going to go through them quickly. And at the time, uh, in the very end, I'll actually spend some time doing some demos to demonstrate some of these technologies. So one challenge that our lab started thinking about is a very simple idea, which is why is it that molecular diagnostics doesn't make it out to the field? So if you were to think about doing chemistry, everybody knows uh, what this object is, right? A pipette, you manipulate fluids, uh, you do all kinds of reactions, and this is the classical way that you would do a molecular diagnosis sitting on a bench. Um, and one of the things we started to realize, it's, it's extremely hard to do out in the field, you make errors, the reagents are not available, and many of the most precise diagnosis techniques don't translate. And at that same time, uh, I was at a, a Christmas party, uh, or my wife was at a Christmas party, and uh, there was a white elephant uh, going on, and she thought that this little toy is something that I would enjoy. I'm gonna play this just so you know what it is. Most of you know this, this is a little music box. You can buy this uh, for a dollar to five dollars, and you can recognize you know that song, right? <laughs> uh, it's essentially playing "Happy Birthday." Uh, the code of that song is written in a piece of this tape. We have used these tapes over centuries to actually program many things. And I'm not going to ask in this crowd if some of you have used the punch card <laughs> tapes. Uh, it's unfortunate on my part that I actually haven't used this truly. But at that same time, I've spoken to many people, realizing that you can program and encode computers using just pieces of holes. What this technology has is very precise timing of actuation. And we started thinking about this. and taking this idea to actually program chemistry. So that gave rise to this tool uh, that we call punch card microfluidics. Now it's a 30 channel music box that we completely repurposed and designed. But instead of computing something or making just sounds, it actually interacts with a fluidic chip that mounts on top. And once that mounts on top, 
you're essentially able to run complex assays. So what we designed this for is to do malaria assays. Um, and uh, this is a tool that we are testing in the field right now. And as you turn this, there are 30 pumps and valves, purely mechanical, no electricity, that are turning on and off to move nanoliter fluids around to be able to run a complex assay. What this does is it takes a drop of blood, uh, it lyses it, it extracts the uh, genomic DNA, and then it runs a RPA assay and then a fluorescent or a colorimetric readout to tell you if you have any of the five species of malaria. We're taking this out to Madagascar and Kenya to test this tool out in the field. Uh, but one of the contexts that emerges for something like this is uh, stripping away the complexity of molecular diagnosis and at that same time making something that's quite visible. So when you play with this tool, you actually see the reactions happening. Uh, this is very much like Foldscope. We're going to try to turn this into a kit so any kid could program and make their own uh, chemistries, uh, although there are a lot of restrictions on doing all kinds of chemistry in classrooms nowadays, but you could do at a smaller scale far more complex chemistries. Uh, and one of the contexts of this is uh, to really be able to do this uh, out in the field and as well as uh, to be able to scale it. I'll show another example of another piece of work uh, and tell you the story behind it. Uh, this is the centrifuge that Jerry mentioned. Uh, at the same time I was in Uganda, uh, there was another experience that I had, which was being in a remote clinic, and I found a site very surprising. And the site was I was walking out of the clinic, and right at the door, as a doorstop, was a nice uh, centrifuge. Uh, something that might cost, you know, five to seven thousand dollars, a micro centrifuge, and it was being used as a doorstop. And I asked my friends, you know, you know, why would you use this? I know other uses of this object. Uh, and he replied that, you know, for the last five years, we haven't actually had electricity. At least this is serving a purpose. Uh, and it kind of triggered this thing in my head that maybe uh, there, there's got to be another way of thinking about this problem. And, uh, you know, as a kid, of course, uh, I am fanatic about toys. I can talk for hours about toys. And it reminded me of an object that you all know very well. Uh, you know, this is a yo-yo. Uh, anybody who is a pro yo-yo uh, thrower here could come and do a much better demonstration than I can. Uh, but I'm going to do this, and again, this is going to be a little bit of a quiz. So what I would like you to predict, or guess for that matter, and I'm going to try to make sure that I throw it and it doesn't fly out of my hand. Uh, many of these toys spin. They rotate. So you could start thinking, huh, you know, could I turn that into a centrifuge? And uh, for a very bad yo-yo throw, here is my try. And I want you to guess how fast this object is spinning. Any, any guesses? Just throw out some numbers. 4,000 RPM. Anybody else? Higher, lower? 400 RPM. Lower, right? Yeah, this is spinning around 3 to 400 RPM. That's my throw. Uh, I had a visiting student who happened to be a circus artist. Uh, <laughs> And his throw actually do go to 4,000 RPM. And he tells me it's all in the wrist. I haven't learned this trick. This is a high-speed video taken with my iPhone. And that's roughly around 4,000 RPM. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, started thinking about this and asking this question, could we understand the physical limits of this? What in laws of physics tells us how fast these objects would spin? It turns out yo-yos are not a great solution because you don't want people throwing samples around. <laughs> it's also incredibly hard to learn. So we went back to the drawing board and we tried playing with all kinds of spinning toys. And then we stumbled upon this uh, wonder uh, which is something that maybe many of you have used. Uh, you take a piece of, uh, say, uh, you take a piece of plastic, you drill two holes in it and put two strings and you spin it around and then you pull the two strings and the spins. Uh, uh, I'm, you know, I call this a button in a string or a whirly gig. Uh, this toy has many, many, many names. Uh, anybody in the sort of on the younger generation side? Any high school kids here? 
Uh, many a times when I uh, have you played with this yet? Yeah. Okay, you have. That's that's the first high school student I've met who does know what this object is. Uh, and what's remarkable about this object? In our first try, we got an RPM, and I'll let you guess this one. Anybody wants to guess how fast that's spinning? Wow, it's around ten thousand RPM, and. You know, we started asking this question. Now you take this object and tell me, what is the fundamental limit of this? How do I really go about understanding this? And we uncovered a, a fact that I didn't know, which is remarkable when I think about it. This toy happens to be the oldest toy in the history of mankind. Around 5,000 years ago, we have found relics of this little spinning thing, uh, and nobody knew how it works. So, uh, you know, kind of the scientist in you suddenly wakes up. It's like, how is that possible? We've been playing with this forever. Why can't we actually explain it? And that, you know, all the applications and stuff are okay, but then the, the goal becomes let's actually understand it. And we took some time, and now that turned into, by understanding the mechanics of that object, we turned into a centrifuge. So I'm going to play this now. All we did is to try to figure out what parameters should go into this object. And I'm going to spin this now. And some of you who have really fine ears can even tell what acoustic frequencies are coming out of that sound. But at this point, we hold the world record for the fastest spinning object with human power. And that happens to be the record is 125,000 RPM. So the reason I mentioned that is I would like you to break it. And I'll tell you a very specific reason why it's important to break that record. Uh, 125,000 RPM would be an equivalent of 30,000 G-forces, if you were to think about at that small scale, that you can use for centrifugation. And the only reason we can do something like this is, uh, hmm, is that, uh, but I'll come back to it. Anyway, with that, kind of an RPM within you know, 30 to 60 seconds, we can separate blood from plasma. I do have all the material here to actually do a demo uh, to do some blood separation. But what I'm going to do is uh, try to keep it for the very end to make sure that we don't run out of time. Uh, and also, some people are a little squeamish about blood being drawn. Uh, but uh, one of the context of this is with a very simple tool, a simple lancet. Uh, and a capillary, uh, I can separate and remove plasma from blood anywhere. Uh, what's important about plasma is the fact that all the RDTs, uh, the sensitivity and the specificity of these rapid diagnostic tests are increased tremendously if you only use plasma because the enzymes in the blood cells would mess up with the, uh, with the tests. Also, just the ratio of the plasma to red blood cell packed volume that you have is an indicator of anemia. Around 3 billion people need to be tested for anemia every year. And one of the contexts that ends up happening, the only reason we can do this is right here. Uh, this is only the first equation of my talk. Uh, <laughs> but what is remarkable about this to me, that toy and this equation is the same thing. Because now we have a complete dynamic understanding of this simple object, which turned out to be not so simple. To actually account for how fast this object could spin, we had to account for a really strange phenomena that happens in strings if you over twist them. It's going to be hard to see, but some of you might appreciate that there are these super coils that form. And to be able to understand them, those super coiling phenomena have been really well understood when DNA is twisted. So we actually took some equations from how DNA twists into supercoils, put that in, and our models matched far better than what we could do before. And here is the real surprise. When we do the theoretical model, it tells me that the upper limit using normal force of a human hand is around a million RPM. Now, why didn't I tell you, uh, why didn't I do a demo of a million RPM? And remember, at a million RPM, you would break Mach 1 pretty easily. So you would have heard a bang, uh, which is not so uncommon. If anybody's used a bullwhip, you know where that sound comes from is when you break the Mach 1 limit. The only reason, it's a little bit of a technical one because of human anatomy. Any pianist in the room? Anybody who plays music? How fast can you hit on a single key? You can count in your head. How fast could you go? How many times can you strike a key in a second? 
four or five. So the upper limit for humans is around four hertz. If you start going faster than that, the force uh, velocity curves tell you that the force is not high enough. And the, because it's a dynamical system, it happens to have an effective resonance around 10 hertz. So a human cannot do that. Uh, although we have a trick up our sleeves where we're trying to change the design of this to build a double resonator, very much like what you do in optics to have two cavities resonate, to be able to push that limit. The reason we want to push that limit further is because I can take the exact same tool and right now using a regular capillary, in 10 minutes we can separate individual malaria parasites from blood. So if you think of diagnosis as finding a needle in a haystack, what something like this does, it pulls the needle out because of its density, quite literally. And you know exactly at that same spot where even if there was one single parasite, where would that be? But it does take around 10 minutes of spinning. Uh, so that's why the challenge that I told you is to break our world record. It's not a joke. I would really like me to, to you to break that world record because we could even uh, do diagnosis rather than in 10 minutes, maybe in five minutes. Uh, and one of the contexts that ends up happening is there are lots and lots of parasites that are found in blood that have densities that are different than other cells. So rather than keep searching for them, African sleeping sickness is a common example. Uh, one of the contexts is you can really pull them out. And this is why centrifugation is such a central tool in diagnostics. Uh, and of course, uh, once you make a tool uh, and a principle, you can make hundreds of them. Uh, this is another one that we built that allows us to now separate nucleic acids. Uh, there is another one in which an entire assay is actually run on the disk itself, so you can run multiple reactions. It's much more like a platform. Uh, when we posted that paper on bioarchive, suddenly all these uh, centrifuges started popping up for an adapter to put uh, Eppendorf tubes in it. And that's the whole point, is to really be able to engage a much larger community to adopt, modify, and understand a tool. And one of the things, uh, for some of you who might not have been engaged in a, a clinical validation, <laughs> this is what a clinical trial of this looks like. This is our uh, lab space in Madagascar. I, right there are two community health workers. When you go out in the field, you think, I am taking this toy. Somebody's going to laugh at me. But the complete opposite happens. This is a gentleman that's lugged around microscopes and centrifuges on his back. For him, this is actually an incredibly powerful tool. And of course, uh, they're chatting and having coffee while spinning this. But the real joy is this was uh, that was right where the access to road is, where we actually do have facilities. Now, this is a quick video of that 12-hour spot that I had told you about earlier. And this happens to be the, the chief of the village testing it out. And right behind her, him is uh, the only community health worker in this, uh, the only female in this room as well. And one of the joys of working out in the field is the smile that you get once a while from your skeptical users. So you see he's playing around. This is also the quickest training session I have done for anybody where I don't speak their language. And that's the context, is when you share the tool, you start understanding how they think. And it's much more of an iterative process to be thinking about building these tools. So uh, I'm going to keep going. I have two more things that I want to tell you about. And then, of course, we will uh, stop to take lots of questions. And then I can do a blood demo for this. Uh, I do have all the supplies uh, to try to actually do that. Um, OK, let's talk about one more tool, uh, which has to do with this uh, uh, a mosquito. Um, and uh, I was walking around before coming here trying to catch a mosquito. Uh, I have two. Uh, and unfortunately, it turns out they're actually not mosquitoes, but that is the point, and I'm going to get to that <laughs> in a second. Um, which is this, is, um, you know, of course, nobody likes mosquitoes. Uh, they are a tremendous problem. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, but does anybody know how many kinds of mosquitoes are there? I didn't mean in number. Of course, there are lots and lots of mosquitoes. But how many kind, how many species of mosquitoes are around? Any guesses? A million. a million species. That would be a lot. <laughs> 5,000. I heard 10,000. Any other numbers? 42. 42. <laughs> yes, the answer to everything. Uh, 
No, that's a good. I'm amazed how with crowdsourcing we can get approximately the right answers. Uh, it's around 3,500 species that we have discovered. Every year we discover a few more. Out of that, only 20 to 21 are actually ones that we know carry human pathogens. The rest are nuisance. And as we deforest, many new species of mosquitoes that can't find their natural host will come out and start biting humans and start carrying diseases. And this dynamics and ecology is extremely complex. And to really make this point very clear, uh, of course, everybody knows uh, mosquitoes are bad, uh, is when Zika hit, you know, millions of people in 40 countries got infected. Everybody's heard of Zika here. Uh, the Brazilian army got involved, and for the few months, they went searching for mosquitoes that were positive of Zika. We had no idea which mosquitoes were actually carrying this disease. We had no idea where the mosquitoes actually were. Sometimes you would find the patients. And I'm curious, uh, for the first few months, how many positive mosquitoes did the Brazilian army find? Uh, any guesses? None. Anybody else? Come on. Millions of people infected, tons and tons of mosquitoes, the whole country galvanizing to find mosquitoes. Any other guesses? One, 40. I'm amazed that you guys are very close, around four. And that states the problem. And of course, later on, they got better at it, and they did a much larger scale surveillance, and we started understanding with species. But when this happens, when a new disease comes about, we know so little about ecology of diseases, especially when it comes out to vectors that have very complex cycles. And one of the threads that starts to happen is how are we ever going to actually build our techniques to counter these diseases when we don't even understand the basic ecology? And one of the contexts that ends up happening is there are fantastic models that exist out there for being able to predict where species of mosquitoes are. This is a world map for Aedes aegypti. One of the challenges with this map is there are very few data points where you can actually infer and tell where the species was actually found. And with climate change, all the changes that are happening with transportation, there are many places that are perfectly ripe to carry a disease. Only one single person needs to arrive to be able to transmit that disease or the other way around where the disease is there but the vector just comes along and transmits it to a new location. Uh, and how do we go about testing and catching mosquitoes? Uh, here's a technology that's out there. Uh, it's around 100, 110 years old. You go out there, you roll up your sleeves and your pants and you sit because you have to catch human biting mosquitoes and I do this all the time and I catch the mosquito right before it's about to bite me. I'm also on some medication, so I'm not too concerned. But if you do this in a place where dengue is there, there's actually a huge concern. There's ethical issues related to that because there is no cure for something like that. And so one of the things we started thinking about, how do you scale up to change to be able to see a picture of the world where you could really understand? So this is a new project that we are starting to think about. Um, and an idea dawned on us, which is uh, related to cell phones. Um, everybody has, probably has a cell phone or two or three in their pocket by now here. Um, and it occurred to us uh, that mosquitoes do something really remarkable. And I'm gonna play this sound and uh, maybe in the very end I might even do a demo uh, to actually show you how to do this. But uh, I apologize, this is gonna be a little bit annoying. You're about to hear how a mosquito makes a sound, uh, and I'll let it play because I get a little bit of pleasure out of uh, just, uh, if somebody just starts squatting. Uh, <laughs> right there was a female, and the male is chasing the female. This is a high-speed video, and one of the phenomenal aspects of this over the years, and this was a paper in 2009 where we actually learned that mosquitoes play love songs to each other. The female has a sound which is being produced by the wing beats, and that sound is heard by the male, and the female modulates that frequency, and then the male is supposed to listen and catch up. Uh, good lesson. Uh, and one of the things that starts to happen is that is an evolutionary strategy look for fitness. And of course, one of the aspects of this is if you start thinking about this is to say, aha, if regular phones could record those acoustics, could there be signatures to identify a species? This is a question that has been thought about in the past. There's a lot of work that had been done to demonstrate it in the lab, 
but there was a no tool out there where you could scale it. And we asked this question, essentially we borrowed all possible cell phones. So right there are all the phones that my lab members have. And one of them happened to have that $20 flip phone. And all the data that we collected for this was from using that device to prove that flip phones actually have SNR that's good enough to record these sounds that you usually can't hear unless you're very close, but your phones can. And this is what a spectrogram for Anopheles looks like. And you see there is a specific frequency in that buzz, and that frequency corresponds exactly to the wing beat frequency of the mosquito. Now we have a signature, and if you do this for all the vector-carrying mosquitoes, so there's around, uh, we have in our database around 19. This is the largest acoustic database for these. We travel around the world, we go to CDC to collect these, and we start realizing that some mosquitoes are spread out, some of them have commonalities, but here lies the crux that if we had globally people to be able to measure these acoustic frequencies and upload them using machine learning tools, we can actually speciate and put a probability number. Some insects or in some species of mosquitoes, it's a little bit harder. For others, it's trivial. Then we use a lot of metadata for when the data was actually collected or where it was collected to be able to make a predictable map of the world. This is in a tool. This is the point where we are. And now we are starting to build a, a mechanism and a method to release this as an app. So all of you, again, remember the whole point of experience, I am hoping you will all actually engage in this process and start to love uh, mosquitoes for at least contributing in the way uh, where we could all collectively make these maps. You know, one thing we could do is complain about it, and the other thing we could do is actually do something about it. Uh, and just to demonstrate to you how trivial it is, uh, here is a quick video. We'll continue again. Uh, all you do is take a cup. I trapped a mosquito right there. I've made two holes in there. I'm putting my mic right next to it. Mosquito, you can actually see, is flying. And right there, I'm just recording the acoustic signature. And I'll just play that as well. And of course, the sound is coming from my phone, so you might not be able to hear it right there. There is a hum, and that's all you need. One second signature to be able to identify mosquitoes. And okay, you don't have, have to listen it, to me. To uh, this so anybody who is interested, you could go to that site and uh, sign up, and we'll send you the set of tools to be able to engage. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes I have, I want to tell you about uh, the last project. Uh, and again, uh, I'll reserve the ending for some of the demos as well. Uh, which is related to microscopy. So I told you many, many tools, but this is the first tool that we started building. So this is a tool that we have spent the most time on and also the most time scaling up. Uh, we asked ourselves a question, whether could you make a functional microscope for a price point of a dollar? At that time, we didn't know whether we could do it. Microscopes are very useful. I don't have to tell this at Genelia. You know, you guys have some of the world's best microscopes out here. But it's incredible. The power to be able to see at the small scale is so incredible. And I think in my mind, life changing, that it is a shame that not every single person on this planet gets to experience that. And so one of the contexts that we thought about when we started this project is how do you make sure that everybody gets that experience? Uh, and that turned into a full scope. And what I'm showing you in front of you is essentially cut out sheets of paper. Uh, right here, it cost us a dollar to make and manufacture, uh, and it allows us to do 700 nanometer resolution imaging at a price point of a dollar. Uh, anybody with a little colored instruction sheet and 10 minutes can assemble a functional tool. And when you assemble the tool, it looks something like this. Uh, I did pick up some water from the pond outside. So in the very end, we could actually see the microcosmos of the Genelia campus. The way I use it, I hold two hands. This is the XY stage. There is a little ramp that allows me to focus. If you find a field of view that's interesting, you take a pencil, you mark it. Uh, there are different kinds of illumination modules, so I can turn that into dark field. This is where I would put a regular slide. And now I could just go into this wonderland and be imaging, and then I'll emerge an hour later. Because uh, when you go to a microscope room, uh, it takes a while before you emerge back. Uh, and one of the contexts that ends up happening with something like this is, uh, so this is the actual tool. Uh, that's the first version of the tool. Now this is the second version of the tool. Uh, 
And in 2014, when we wrote this paper uh, to, uh, the paper was really about micro-optics, the fact that you can do this with very, very small lenses. Uh, we were very happy, you know, we had something, we published the paper, there was also the first paper from my lab, so, you know, we went to bed, wake up the next day, and nothing changed. <laughs> this is a common experience for most scientists in the audience, when you write a paper, it's like, you know, wake up, nothing changes. Uh, and especially for work like this, one of the challenges is to ask is, you know, uh, uh, the intellectual output is there, but we had to do something more. We had to really prove to the world that it's actually possible at scale. And this is also something that I think about very, I take it to heart, is the fact that once you are in the business of building and designing tools, the joy is in sharing that tool. That's really when things explode. So. Uh, we turned the lab into a robotics factory, essentially, and we put a challenge on ourselves. We said we will build 50,000 of these microscopes, and we had one line on our web page. Anybody in the world who writes us an email asking for a microscope, we're going to ship them. We spent more money shipping. It costs, you know, $25 to ship to Sudan than making the tools, but it's very important to build a global community of people and just ask whether this experiment is even possible. And now a couple years later, we have shipped around 80,000 fold scopes to 130 countries in the world. And you know, it might think like a very simple tool, but at that same time, when it lands in the right hands, and it lands in the hands of healthcare workers, of uh, you know, a gardener who's working, or even a professor of history who's just never wondered about, hey, I'm gonna try to do something like this. Or scientists like myself, when I, how many of you are carrying your microscopes in your pocket right now? <laughs> okay, I am carrying my microscope. That's the point, is that it's not about haves and have nots, it's about having this experience. So many times when I think about this tool, I think about, what we're trying to do is a pencil for microscopy. Just like you carry a pencil with you, you should really carry a scientific tool that you, if you care about the microscopic world so much. And what this did to me, which was an experiment, we couldn't predict it. It's not about the tool, it turned out it's about the community. It's these group of people and what they do is what makes a full scope tick. And you know that can be represented graphically from around the world. In, smiles of kids and adults and things people do. And I made a quick video, this is a two minute video that I'll play that I'll narrate just to show you different contexts and different places that a tool like this gets used. Uh, so this is a spot in, it's Kaziranga in the eastern part of India. This is where some of the last rhinos in India are left. This is the first time I ran a microscopy workshop where soldiers kept their guns outside because they're rangers to then build microscopes. Uh, this is roughly the cost of all the parts. It takes 10 minutes to make. This is the kind of data that you get. That's actually from Panama. It's a sand fly that carries Leishmaniasis. Uh, this is a ladybug's uh, legs. This is in a crustacean. This is a developing ant. You're seeing cells migrating in a time-lapse video. That's your usual. Anybody knows what that was? I'll ask that later when we come back to it. This is Madagascar. Uh, a phenomenal thing about this place is 80% of the species that are there are only found there. And some of the kids, of course, found lice from their head. Uh, many of them sketch. They don't have tools like cell phones, uh, so they really draw. This is Tanzania. Uh, in Tanzania, we ran a sanitation program to really try to understand by seeing the microscopic world, could you convince kids to wash their hands? Uh, this is India, that's Dharamshala. This is a remote place in Tamil Nadu. This is in Lebanon, almost a couple of miles from the Syrian border in a refugee camp. And one of the contexts that you start realizing, millions of kids are not going to school, and the fact that they still have capacity to smile is absolutely amazing. Now, this is in the US. And something very important is going to happen in this video now. I want you to pay close attention when it comes about. Right there. Everybody knows. This is a public school in LA. Um, 
you know, microscopy changes people's opinion about the world they live in. It's a very simple fact. There is an online community where people document their experiments. We don't tell them what to do. There is a zero experiment that go in the kit. It's an open slate. You do what you want. It's very important that you document what you do. And the philosophical context of that is, you know, we can make as many microscopes as we want at this point, but we can't make mentors. And what becomes very important, and this is a pitch to all of you, because I know you all care about science, is when you start thinking like that, then suddenly you're connected to people around the world with a common tool. The data you're able to collect right here in Genalia is exactly the same kind of data somebody else far away in the world should be able to collect, or in your backyard in Washington itself. Uh, and one of the contexts that starts to happen is the, that's why I meant to say that the community is even far more important than the tool because these members, anywhere around the world, every day, somebody is running a full scope workshop. I'm never even aware of it. And that just primarily happens because we give them the ownership to just engage and take it in any direction they care about. There's a kid in Nigeria who used the tool to detect fake currency. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, in microscopy. There is a group that's used it to detect fake drugs. We work on many diseases, including schistosomiasis. We have a new lens that we now uh, are testing for malaria. One of the contexts that starts to happen is uh, in plant diseases. There is a group in India that's been using it to essentially detect plant diseases early so you could isolate. So all these applications I had never dreamed of. And if I had thought that, oh, I'm going to come up with the application and then really think about the tool, I would have missed this opportunity. If we had stopped just publishing that paper, we would have missed this opportunity. And this is sort of, that really changed my opinion about how I think about scientific tools. Just like as a scientist, nobody tells me what to do. You know, give me the tools, give me the questions, and I'm going to forge my own journey. This is essentially extremely, this is how we should teach. And this is where it comes into play, where you get to decide as an individual which direction you will take. So, you know, the community, uh, if I was to have this scroll, there are thousands and thousands of posts around the world. You just go to microcosmos.foldscope.com. And while I was talking, maybe a kid from around the world in their language just made a post. Maybe, maybe that observation happens to be a new species. We don't know. You know, if you want to name a species on your name, either look for millimeter, submillimeter spiders or microscopic things. That's, you know, there are no more new species of tigers left, so you have to go small. We're now thinking about a new program where we will every week essentially try to uh, get some of these samples that people are imaging around the world sequence to really understand whether what we're finding. And one of the contexts that ends up happening is every one of these posts has a DOI. Anybody can cite this work. I myself have found things in the field that I'm now spending two years writing papers on those observations. The same thing happens many times. Uh, many scientists look at this database and then essentially follow on on that work. And it's not about kids. And there is no hierarchy in this community. So my post is right next to a four or six year old from anywhere else in the world. And it's just much more about the power of asking questions and being able to share these questions very openly. Uh, so I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to show you all these videos. So let me just skip to this. And uh, one thing we did, uh, we told ourselves that this year we will try to release a million instruments. Uh, we're kind of on track for something like that. Uh, and one of the threads that starts to happen with this is I want to take some questions, so I'm going to skip this little bit. And then, of course, we can do demos. Uh, just to get you a context of this is the kind of data that you get out of uh, a full scope. Uh, this happens to now be a ciliate. Uh, and uh, just using this, I actually discovered something quite remarkable about the ciliate. It's rolling around in a cytoplasmic ball. And all this came from. Uh, uh, my mother-in-law had given me flowers. I had ignored them, unfortunately. And something was growing in it. And then I just decided to take a drop right on my dining table and find this wonderful biodiversity. And you know, when you ask, see something like that, you then start questioning, where did that biodiversity actually come from? Was it already in the flowers? Because flowers are shipped around the world. Or was it growing and spores are flying around in the air? So one of the things that we're trying to do is share these curiosities uh, with people such that they get to ask their own questions. 
And then uh, the simplest vision that we really have is how do you make tools and something like a microscope that every single kid in the world could have it in their pocket? Uh, and I'll close with this photograph. This photograph is very dear to me. Uh, anybody notice something funny in this? You know, the parents are not giving the tool to the kids. <laughs> That's the point. It is the point because then once you essentially get engaged and become that kid, then we might actually be able to communicate to the kids uh, in a powerful way. I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So it sounds like what you're saying for the mosquito, the male. Yes. Um, has, uh, has uh huh. And is the frequency different for the female? That is correct. So males uh, have a completely different frequency than females. And one of the things that you want to do, because only females actually bite humans, because they need blood for making eggs. And so one of the contexts that you do is uh, most likely if you find a mosquito around you, it's most likely a female uh, if it's hovering around you. That's correct, yes, that's a fantastic idea. So what uh, you're mentioning is use sound to mess up and attract mosquitoes and trap them. Uh, that is an idea that's been tried very recently, last year. There is one paper where if you want, on your cell phone, you can play the mosquito song and it'll attract, but most likely it'll attract males, reducing the males. I mean, maybe it's gonna have a dent in the population. It's harder to attract females to those sounds, but that is a, that's an excellent idea, yes. Other questions? Yes? What is the kind of resolution that you are talking about in this microscope? Yeah, so the resolution, the best resolution we can do is around 700 nanometers. And so a diffraction limited microscope could go all the way to around 200, 250. Now, of course, there are microscopes that even can go smaller. But one of the contexts that you should understand that the video that you saw, you were actually watching in a phase contrast mechanism, subcellular organelles inside cells. Uh, the most common lens, we make many lenses, but the most common lens we send and uh, ship to kids around the world is around 150x lens. And that's essentially trying to say something that you can barely perceive that the macroscopic things were there. But at that same time, with a tool like this, we image, you know, uh, chromosomes segregating and cells dividing and cilia and many types of uh, phenomena that you would normally think about. And that was the hardest bit is to push on that resolution to be able to make a tool. And one thing that I did, I did bring a whole bunch of these microscopes and I can talk as much as I want. It's not going to actually make that impression unless you actually use it. So uh, maybe in the very end, I might do a brief demo, but otherwise you can come up and use the tool. Yes. Yeah, so we make uh, several kinds of lenses. The most common lens is a glass lens. Uh, it's a spherical lens, and one of the tricks, this is hidden in the paper in the supplement, page five, uh, is it's actually extremely important for micro lenses to completely optimize the apertures. So, of course, these are uh, glass uh, ball lenses, but with an optimal aperture designed for imaging. In uh, laser optics, people have used ball lenses for, uh, you know, coupling lasers, but one of the things that you're doing is you're not imaging. And so from an imaging context, you have to have an optimized aperture. So the way we make these lenses is uh, it's a grinding technique, uh, and that gives a very smooth surface to begin with. And then we use a component from the electronics industry, which is these vacuum tapes. So we make, I mean, literally a lens in six seconds. And that's how we can scale up to build robots that can make many of these. And so it's on a roll to roll. And of course, the sheets are being cut out in a roll to roll. And then you integrate them together. Yeah, so the manufacturing is actually fascinating. And that's been the six years of the process. Yes? How much light do you need? I mean, because it looks like a lot of people are looking into the sun. Yeah, so you never look into the sun. That would be bad. Uh, 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 there are a couple of modalities. You can mount different illuminations at the back. So right now, if I put a sample in it, I, haven't, I don't have a sample, but I am already imaging if I just have some ambient light, for example. 
Uh, so you just need to be if you're outdoors, but then otherwise there are also these modules, which is just essentially an LED, and we shape that LED. There's also a condenser lens on the illumination module as well. Then when you do that, now I've clipped that on, and now you don't need anything outside. So you can do microscopy over the night. Uh, uh, <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> uh, just go to foldscope.com. I think one important lesson to remember here is you might be thinking you are getting something, but I'll just remind you, uh, if you are not a microscopist, this is an addictive habit. So please be mindful. And then the other aspect of this is if you join our community, you are signing up to be a mentor, whether you like it or not. And that's a very important philosophical context of how we build our community. Uh, of course, anybody can do whatever they want with these tools, but we would like you to engage, whether you are a scientist or a non-scientist, to engage with the broader audience. You know, find a person. We used to ship fold scopes, and we would always include two microscopes in one kit. And the reason was you keep one to yourself, and you give the second one to somebody who has never seen through a microscope. The fact that we know the word microscope, you're already above a certain bar. Uh, but, you know, there is a majority of this population probably on this planet is walking around without ever experiencing what the microscopic life looks like. So anyway, this is a philosophical rant uh, that I'm hoping if people join the community, uh, you uh, engage in that philosophy. Yes? Uh huh. Uh, we have a program where you essentially, there's a nominate, donate program. So people around the world, you might have gone to a school in Namibia or in Pennsylvania. You remember that teacher, you nominate that school, and anybody else can then sponsor that school. So there are all kinds of programs online, and many of these programs we didn't come up with. It's actually very important to understand, we focus on making the tools, but the ownership of implementation belongs to people. So. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example. In India, we implemented a program that's about to be released now with the government of India, where they came on board and said the science and technology ministry, where any kid in India at this moment can sign up on a website, write a one paragraph of what they would like to do, and they get a micro grant. Micro grant is $100 and a couple of full scopes. And you do whatever you want as long as you document. And that's a program that the, uh, the people at the science and technology office there in India came up with. They are owning the program. They are running the program. So anybody who wants to engage in, we've tried something like that in the US uh, without success as yet. Uh, but that's the point, is that there are lots of organizations uh, including people who spend a lot of time in the field or are actually are far more aware of how to integrate with the educational context even in the United States, and they run and build their own programs. The ownership needs to belong to people who implement the program. The ownership doesn't belong to us. Other questions? Yes, all the way yes. back. Uh, first, I want to thank you for doing this kind of work. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm from Bolivia, and I, when I was a kid, I failed that. Uh -huh. So we, we have all the kids have this curiosity, uh -huh. but we don't have the tools. Even yeah. when you go to the university on those countries, you don't have the tools. Yeah. I have, I was lucky enough to get out of my country and do some science. But when I started there, I remember uh, building our own ovens, our own <laughs> centrifuges uh -huh. using uh, domestic tools. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. Uh, I'm I am very 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 happy that you are doing this kind of work for to to have the kids that are over there enjoy this kind of yeah, science. And, uh, I mean, I think uh, an important lesson in something like this is uh, you know sometimes not having resources teaches you grit. And that's one thing you need in science as well. So in some sense, sometimes when I have little and I'm stumbling on this problem, thinking about how to solve it, it actually is a new skill that you gain as well. And a very important aspect of what you mentioned, since now you're in Bolivia and you understand that context, you would be the right person to think about how to take this tool. By the way, anybody who speaks languages other than English, uh, anybody who wants to translate the instructions, uh, just send me a message. It's only two pages, it takes half an hour, and by translating just this one sheet, you will open and access, make act this tool accessible to a much broader group of people. We already have around 50 translators, but I'm trying to hit the 100 mark, so that would be very useful. And then the other thing would be is, 
you asking yourself, how can I engage? And you know, not just this tool, there are many tools that are out there, but it's extremely important to have mentors. You know, without that handholding, you know, I spend a lot of time just commenting on the work that many kids and people do in the community because they care. And then I give them advice on how to run their experiments. And there are hundreds of scientists around the world who do that. And that's a very powerful part of the community. So if you already are fortunate to be a scientist, it's almost, you know, it is our, uh, it's our obligation uh, to do something like that. And I think sometimes people complain, oh, I don't have different avenues. I'm just opening one avenue. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. You said that when you were out in the field, uh -huh. you were being exposed to various diseases, yes. including malaria. Yes. But you were not concerned yes. that concern because you were taking an antimicrobial agent. Yeah. Are you at liberty to tell us what you were taking? Uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, there's tons of medicines that you can take specifically for malaria. Uh, and one of the things that ends up happening is uh, in, in travel medicine, uh, those medicines are fantastic, and there are lots of examples. Of they're too expensive, and there have been ideas around eradicating malaria and thinking about mass drug administration for those some of those medicines, but they would not be cost. When I spend and go out to the field, I mean, I pay around $50 for one week of dosage, but it costs around a couple thousand dollars. So one of the context of this is... Uh, with infectious diseases, we have some drugs. I mean, if some of you are not aware of this, uh, with malaria, uh, there is a drug-resistant malaria that's coming out in Southeast Asia, in Burma, Cambodia. And one of the challenges, our last molecule, our demycin, is not working anymore. And so we are in on the edge where we have diseases that uh, will really spread very fast, but we don't really have a molecule to tackle that. Uh, so that in itself is complicated, and this is why diagnostics becomes very important. WHO has a, has a statement in which you are not supposed to give malaria medication, a therapy to a person, unless uh, they have been positively diagnosed. And that is, on paper, that's very hard policy to practice because most people don't have access to diagnostics or reliable diagnostics. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I don't work on cholera. There are some wonderful people working and thinking about cholera. And I think one thing that I definitely do know is the disease ecology is as important as the disease. So one of the reasons with many of these diseases we started focusing on the mosquitoes is we were very curious by there are sometimes you can pinch the disease in the human and sometimes you need to go to the other host. So one of the fascinating things about cholera is that it's ecology when it spreads, it spreads so fast and you know what happened in Haiti and, and we have very, I mean, we know fantastic things about what happens in the lab, uh, but sometimes what happens out in the field and especially now with new tools coming about, you know, some people have heard of this USB size uh, sequencer that's out. I'm quite excited about that because it opens up doors to do field science that can be at the same quality as you could do in the lab. So that's an important thing to think about. And there are certain diseases. We work on schistosomiasis, where we know neither a diagnosis test nor a drug will actually solve the problem. We have to go to the ecology. We have to cure the snails that actually transmit or remove the snails that transmit it. So sometimes it's complex. Even when you have diagnosis and drugs, you might not be able to actually cure a disease. Any other questions? Yes. The x-ray tape. Yes. That's not my work, by the way. This is a faculty in UCLA physics. Yes. You know, I, I imagine the bigger the role, the x-rays bigger. Uh, Can you actually take yeah. an x-ray? Yeah, I mean, right there I showed you a picture of an x-ray of a finger. Uh, that then turned into, that single experiment turned into a company. It turns out scotch tape is not the most optic, uh, optimal adhesive. So they tested hundreds of adhesives. And of course, because it's a company, those are proprietary. I actually don't know which adhesives work the best, but at that same time, there is enough dosage to really be able to do x-rays in the field. And one of the threads that ends up happening is uh, uh, depending on how you use and design the tool, of course, it might not be enough for doing, uh, say, full body x-rays and things like that, but depending on arms and limbs, this is something that they're thinking about. Uh, it is the same film. You can also just do the passive regular films. I mean, those films are very sensitive, actually. So the exposure films are similar. 
But then again, I mean, there is a company that does this. And the only thing I know was the last time the published paper was there. After that, it's, uh, it's in the dark for right now. Yes. There's, there's no question that you're a genius. Oh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it's, uh, and you have a big heart. Uh -huh. And it's um, and the research that you're conducting, it just, it, it's, it, it just touches me. I'm sure Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a comment. Yes. One of, one of the comments is, has to do with mechanically electrical generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. that seems to be part of the problem yeah. in some of these remote areas. Yeah. Bicycles or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, isn't that something that, that, that not that you're interested in, in design, because the design probably already there, yeah. yeah. But implement uh -huh. in these remote areas yeah. to facilitate yeah. This or right, that, and then listening to and just understanding mm -hmm. that that Valeri mm -hmm. is your primary focus, right? And understanding that that um, now this might get a bad response. Right? <laughs> Say it. But um, <laughs> there is such a a um, what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. if you consider yeah. how many yeah. people have been affected, yeah, killed mm -hmm. by that disease, it it staggers the mind. I mean you're yeah. you're looking at Stalin and, and yeah. Mao and yeah. Hitler and No, I'm everything combined. Yeah. 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 Do you understand what I'm saying? No, absolutely. I think this is not a hypothetical thing. People sit around tables actually discussing these things. And because of the eliminate initiatives, there are 30 countries that have signed up. India is one of them about eliminating malaria soon. But we are nowhere close. We don't have the right tools. And I think one of the aspects about this is, of course, reconsidering old tools, but frankly, really focusing on new tools. Uh, and I mean, gene drives is a classic example. A lot of people are very excited about it. It's a mechanism that you can really kill a vector population by transgenic mosquitoes. But there are also questions. Because we don't know what happens when you release a few mosquitoes, how this gene drive will evolve. And so kind of one focus that we've been making is also thinking about making measurements in ecology and making better tools such that when we have the right set of tools, we will be able to implement them in a systematic way. What was problem in what was done with DDT was we were not measuring what it's doing to the environment. We were like, oh, we have a golden bullet. Let's go out there. This is the classic case in ecological manipulation is we need to learn how to measure our planet better. And the only way to do that would be is that a larger majority of people engage in that process. Of course, autonomous tools will help, but we need a far, you know, maybe 100 times more scientists on this planet to really be able to measure the health and the ecology of the planet. So I'm sort of of the camp that all tools are on the table as long as we are actually making measurements for what's happening in the field. There are phenomenal examples. There is a classic paper in Nigeria and in Kenya where when one species of mosquito was removed, the number of malaria cases did not drop because another species just found the hotspot and swapped it. And suddenly you say, huh, wait a second, uh, what's going on? Maybe because we didn't understand it. OK. A good note. I think we have to cut off the questions. I'm sorry. Please join me in thanking you.